This tutorial is brought to you by one of the authors of Revising Professional Writing, now in its third edition. My students call me Dr. Kim. The publishers made this video available under a Creative Commons license. For more information, contact ParleyPress.com. Remember, you can use the pause button at any time, and if you see shadows or something weird on the screen, try changing your playback quality settings. Well, the view you see here includes everything you might learn about professional writing in my tutorials. There are others that help you understand content development, organization, style, and mechanics, as well as the rhetorical context that determines which content, organization, or style is going to be effective in a specific situation. Let me remind you briefly that although your primary interest in this tutorial is the message itself, successful professional writing can only be judged by taking into account the context, in other words, writer's purpose and audience. I'm going to focus on addressing business people from Western cultures who place a high value on efficiency. If you haven't listened to the tutorials on audience and purpose yet, take a few minutes to do it now. All right, This tutorial focuses on one area of style and tone in professional writing. I'm talking about conciseness. I'm certain you've heard about conciseness before. My goal, however, is to get you thinking about its impact in a business context and to explain specific techniques for achieving it in your own writing. We'll consider the style of an executive summary for a business plan. Although you probably can't read the page from this document on the screen, you can always download one at prosewrite.com. The plan was written by a nonprofit organization called Helping Hands to secure funding for its activities from private philanthropic foundations. When you think about the audience for this business plan, you should realize they're not going to be experts about the writer's organization, and they're probably at least somewhat skeptical of or sensitive to the writer's request for funding. All of this means the writer has to increase the audience's readiness to accept their message. My task in this tutorial is to explain the four obstacles to conciseness and convince you why overcoming these obstacles is important in the business plan. Start with the first obstacle to conciseness, which is overuse of the main verb be. Overuse occurs when a form of the verb, that means am, is, was, were, been, being, etc., is used instead of a more informative verb. To overcome this obstacle, you need to identify be as a main verb and then locate a more specific verb that could retain the meaning of the original. Take a second to assess the use of be in the sentence shown here. First, is there a form of be in this sentence? Yes, the word is is a form of be. Is it the last verb form? That's an easy way to tell if it's the main verb. Yes, it's followed by a preposition, not another verb form. Can you locate other words? could be anything, a noun, adjective, or prepositional phrase that could be converted into a verb in this sentence. What about identification, which could be converted to identifies? Utilization could be converted into uses. The revised version of the sentence is more concise because several so-called empty words have been deleted. Note the change has little, if any, effect on the reader's ability to understand the message. Rather, the change makes the message more efficient. It also creates a less academic tone. The second obstacle to conciseness is the use of expletives. Linguistically, an expletive structure contributes no meaning. It consists of the word there or it followed by a form of the verb be again. To overcome the obstacle, you need to identify the expletive and then locate an alternative noun and verb that conveys the same meaning in the sentence. Here's another sentence from Helping Hands Business Plan. Do you see the word there or it? Yes, the sentence begins with it. Is it followed by a form of the verb be? Yes, it's followed by is. Can you identify an alternative noun and verb that would convey the same meaning from the original sentence? The revised sentence shows that the writer could delete the first four words and begin with the noun, the number of children, followed by the verb phrase, will increase, in order to achieve more conciseness while conveying the same meaning as in the original sentence. One of the advantages of this revision is the forcefulness of the writer's tone. The sentence sounds like it was created by a professional who's confident about what he or she needs to say to the reader. 
think about it. How many successful professionals are wimpy? On the other hand, it may be important to the writer to hedge his or her claim slightly by using the other option shown here. This revision substitutes we estimate for it is. Often writers resort to expletive structures when trying to avoid the use of personal pronouns. This may be good advice for some forms of college writing, but it's terrible advice for professional writing. All business is ultimately about people, so writers need to use personal pronouns like we and you in professional settings in order to achieve a personal tone with their employees, their supervisors, their clients, their vendors, etc. While the first revision achieves the most business-like style for Western business people, either of the revisions is preferable to the expletive in the original sentence. When writers use expletive structures often, they create an impersonal, academic, or bureaucratic tone, and that won't be good for business. Let's move on to the third obstacle to conciseness, the use of nominals. A nominal is a verb which has been made into a noun by adding an ending like M-E-N-T or A-N-C-E. To overcome this obstacle, you need to identify the nominal and then convert it back into a verb. In general, verbs are more forceful than nouns. Here's another sentence from the Helping Hand business plan. Can you identify a nominal? Yes, intervention is a nominal. How can it be converted back to a verb? The revision I'm showing you here is one possibility. While the change is small when considering a single sentence, it is significant when you consider its impact within Helping Hands Business Plan, which has an audience with low readiness to accept the request for funding. In situations like this, the successful professional writer does whatever he or she can to make it more efficient for the reader to get the message and to establish the writer as a competent professional. All right, we'll move on to the fourth and final obstacle to conciseness, the use of hedges. To overcome this obstacle, you need to identify the hedge and then eliminate it. Consider this sentence from the same business plan we've been discussing. The writer's use of we think at the beginning of the sentence hedges the truth of the writer's claim. Another common hedge is I believe. As experienced students, you've learned well that teachers expect you to hedge the truth of nearly every claim you make. In Western businesses, however, professionals are expected to make claims forcefully whenever possible. So the revised sentence omits the hedge. That leaves only the claim. We can respond quickly, which should be said in a forceful style in order to overcome the reader's skepticism about granting money to the writer's organization. Not all hedges are a bad idea, but you can safely avoid I think and I believe when making anything but the most highly sensitive claims in professional situations. It's time to check your understanding of conciseness by revising a sentence from a report written by a financial advisor for a client. Pause the recording to look at the passage. In order to revise, you should identify obstacles to conciseness in the original. Note that the original uses a nominal definition, which could be converted into a verb defines. Note also the main verb be is used in the original sentence. It can be beneficial. This can be made more concise by removing the verb form be and converting the adjective beneficial to the verb benefits. One way of revising for conciseness is shown here. The four obstacles to conciseness have been discussed by referring to a business plan written for decision makers and philanthropic foundations. Because those readers are not ready to simply accept the organization's request for funding, the writer must be concerned with the style as well as the substance of the document. You may have been told to avoid empty words in your writing. This tutorial identifies which words should be considered empty, forms of be when used as a main verb, expletive structures, nominals, and hedges. Identifying these obstacles and then revising for conciseness makes two important improvements to Helping Hand's business plan. First, the revisions make the document more efficient by reducing the number of words the audience has to read to get the information they need. Second, the revisions make the document more effective for an audience of Western business people by creating a more forceful and business-like tone.
Before I end this tutorial on conciseness, it's important to say that the shortest message is not necessarily the best. If that were true, professional writers could simply avoid sending any message at all. Writers must be careful to include all of the informative and persuasive content their readers might need. There's no gain in efficiency if the reader misunderstands or has unanswered questions. If it's a highly motivated reader, he or she might actually call the writer to ask questions, even if it's not efficient. But a less motivated reader will simply dismiss the writer's message. So the key is to provide all of the needed information using a style that's as concise as possible. Good style ensures not only the effectiveness of the professional writer's message, but also the efficiency with which the reader gets it. As I've said many times, Western workplace audiences appreciate efficiency.